Part one. You are going to listen to a telephone conversation between two people, a customer and an assistant in a gift shop. First, look at questions one to four. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions one to four. I'd like to send some flowers and some chocolates. Okay, I'll just get the computer on. Right. Can I just take your details? Yes, certainly. Your name? Angela Love. Angela Love. And your address? A hundred and forty-four A Orchard Heights, Marsh Drive, Edinburgh. Right. And the postcode? Ah,、uh, I don't know. I'm just. Oh, it doesn't matter. What What exactly is it you'd like to send? Um, a bouquet of flowers. And how much would you like to spend? Thirty pounds. Any particular flowers? I don't know. Um, um, something exotic, perhaps. Okay. And you wanted a box of chocolates? Yeah. To what value? Ah,、uh, say twenty-five pounds. Right, twenty-five pounds, and. The chocolates. What would you like?、Uh, dark, white, milk, liqueurs, or a mixture? Well, a mixture, I suppose, but no liqueurs, and more white chocolates than the others. I'll just write this on the order form. Mixture, mostly white, no liqueurs. That's it. And these are to go within Edinburgh? No, they're to go to Cardiff in Wales. There'll be a delivery charge of nineteen pounds for both items, I'm afraid. For both, not each. Yes, that's right. Before the speakers continue their conversation, look at questions five to ten. As you listen to the rest of the dialogue, complete the order form by filling in the numbered spaces five to ten. And how would you like to pay, madam? By switch card, if I may. Of course, that's fine. And the number? It's five six nine zero double zero. Five six nine zero zero zero. Two one two eight nine seven. Two one two eight nine seven. Eight eight four two two three. Eight eight four two two three seven seven. Can I just check that five six nine zero 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 two one two eight nine seven eight eight four two two three seven. Yes, that's it. So the total amount to be debited is seventy four pounds. Okay. And to whom would you like them sent? To Mrs. Easter. That's E A S T E R. Yes. And the address? Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Roundtree Road. Is that R O W A W N T R W E? Yes, that's it. Cardiff. Cardiff. C A one three eight Y U. C A one three eight Y U. And did you want any message to go with the flowers and chocolates? Yes. Um. Congratulations on passing your test. Just let me know when you're out on the road. Love, Angie. Someone's just passed their driving test, then. Yes, my mother. Your mother? Yeah, it's her sixth attempt. All、oh, right, that is a cause for celebration. Yes. And when would you like them delivered? The day after tomorrow, between nine and eleven a.m. That's the seventeenth in the morning, between nine and eleven. I just need to take a daytime contact number. I'll give you my mobile number. It's o nine six three. Three seven one five double five. O nine six three three one seven. No, three seven one five double five. Three seven one five five five. 
I'll arrange this for you now. OK, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a nice day. You too. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk given by the university sports representative of the student union at a university. First, look at questions 11 to 13. Good afternoon. My name is Mick Clark and I'm the sports rep from the Students' Union. As well as these talks on the university sports facilities, information will be put up on notice boards all over the campus, so you will definitely all know where to find us. Well, as you have probably realised, the university is spread all over the place and the sports facilities are, I'm afraid, no different. If you look at the map, here on the screen. You'll see we, we are here on Thames Street opposite the City Library. If you look down at the bottom of this map on the right you'll see Burse Road. On the left of the police station between the shopping complex and the theatre and the Phoenix Theatre is the University Sports Complex. Before the sports representative continues his talk look at questions 14 to 17. The complex is arranged over four floors, two above ground and two below. The buildings were just completed last year, funded by an anonymous donor. The swimming pool is on the lower ground floor and we're very lucky in that a full-sized Olympic pool is to be built by the end of this academic year, along with a new sauna. In addition, there are a number of other facilities, including various courts, and I would strongly advise you to book well in advance if you want to use any of these courts, as they're very much in demand. Mm, we have full changing facilities, three large halls for aerobics and other classes, three squash courts and two badminton courts. And two other exciting developments in the pipeline are a state-of-the-art gym and an ice skating rink. There are also courts for playing softball and basketball and there is, of course, a cafeteria which is run by the Students' Union so the prices are reasonable. A welcome addition is the bar which is due to open shortly. For outdoor sports, I'm afraid we have to go further afield. The university grounds for rugby, football, hockey and cricket are on the edge of the city centre in the southwest, on the north bank of the river, as you can see from this map. The rowing and canoeing clubs, which are very popular, also run from there. The only bus that goes to the university sports fields directly from here is the 553. No, sorry, it's the 53. It is fortunately very frequent and runs late into the night. The last buses, either way, are around 12.30. But there is also a minibus service 
which is pretty frequent and reliable, and the times are posted at the Students' Union office. If you want to join up for any of the clubs, you just have to see the reps on the stalls at the different societies' stalls outside. Anyway, thanks for taking the time to come in and listen, and I wish you every success whether you decide to take up some form of sport. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a conversation between a tutor and two students who are inquiring about student awards. First, look at questions 21 to 26. Come in. Ah, oh, Sandra and Derek, come in, come in. Good morning, Dr. Warner. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning, Dr. Warner. Good morning, Derek. We know you're busy, but have you got a moment? Yes, for the moment I'm free. What can I do for you? We just wanted to ask your advice about applying for awards. Oh, right. Uh, which awards are you interested in? Well, I'm interested in the FBT award for a grant to travel abroad. And I'd like to apply for the Bissica Travel Award for a research grant in entomology in Jordan. OK. Uh, you do know that you have to satisfy a number of criteria to be eligible for each award. Yes. The book is here somewhere. Right, here it is. Uh, for you, Derek, uh, let's see. The FBT award. Hmm. The conditions for that are you have to be in your fourth year, as you are. OK. You have to be a British or Commonwealth citizen, so you're OK on that one as well. Yes. And you have to come in the top five students in your year in your finals. Ah, uh, right. Well, obviously that I won't know until I've um, taken my exams. No, but you should put in the application now, as the deadline is the end of June. No, sorry, it's May. And that's before the, before the exams even start. So they expect you to tell them afterwards. And are there any other criteria? Let's see. Hmm. Well, it says here you have to be under 25 years of age at the end of your final year. Are you? I won't be 25 until September the 27th, so that's OK. And do I need any referees? Yes, uh, two. And I'm happy to do one for you and... I was also thinking of asking Dr Jameson. Yes, I'm sure he'll gladly do one for you. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 27 to 30. These questions, there are four alternatives, A, B, C and D. Decide which alternative is the most suitable for what you hear and circle the appropriate letter. And Sandra? Yes? The Bissica Award is a lot stricter as it's for a much larger sum of money and you must realise that the competition is very stiff indeed. Yes, I've heard it's not easy to get one as there are only three per year. Yes, you're right. Unlike the FBT award, for which there are ten bursaries, 
The first thing you have to know is that application is by way of a 5,000 word summary outlining how you intend to use the money. Of course, accompanied by a covering one-page form with all your personal details. Yes, I know about that. But what I wanted to know is whether there are examples of other applications I can look at. Well, not really. Uh, the summary has to be very much an original piece, and that I cannot emphasize enough. If there are any signs of it having been copied, then... I see, but will you be able to read it through for me? Oh, I don't see why not. Oh, that's all right then. What do you think my chances are of my getting one of the grants? It's difficult to say. Uh, there's usually about 20 to 30 people applying every year. And this year? Well, I'd imagine it's about the same. Who decides? Well, there is a panel of five trustees, and once you have submitted everything mm. to the departmental secretary, they each receive a copy of your full application. But do you think I stand a chance? Well, as I said, it's not easy to say. It's up to the trustees. OK. Another thing that I would stress is that the applications must be typed, very tidy and properly bound. With a ring binder? Yes. There have been complaints in previous years about the lack of care taken in completing the forms and essays. Uh, this applies to you too, Derek. Yes. Well, it's only fair. After all, we are asking for help. Yes. Is there anything else I can help you with while you're here, Sandra? No. Thank you very much for all your help. Derek? No. And thank you for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture delivered by a guest speaker on demographic changes. First look at questions 31 to 40. Thank you for inviting me here to speak to you today at your Department of Social Sciences. As I'm sure you already know, the title of my talk, Europe Goes Grey, relates to the marked demographic change which has taken place in Europe since the 1960s. Just a few statistics showing the projected trends will illustrate this. By the year 2029, Almost one in four of the population of the UK will be over the present retirement age of 60 years for women and 65 for men. By the year 2020, Italy, for example, will have both the oldest population, with 23.2% aged 65 and over, and, at the same time, the lowest fertility rate. Furthermore, a 1997 report from the UK Office for National Statistics notes that since 1950, the number of centenarians has increased at the rate of just under 7% a year, faster than for most other age groups, and will continue to do so into the next century. The main reasons for the generally increased lifespan are self-evident. These are simply a better diet, better housing, and above all, the ever-improving standard of health care. The social reasons for the changed demographic profile of Europe, that is, the increasing proportion of the elderly relative to the middle and steadily diminishing young generations, are, of course, the falling birth rate as a result of widespread birth control and the education and increasing participation of women in the workforce. This change raised two profound questions, one social and one economic, and it is these that I propose to examine here today. At the end, 
I intend to share with you a few thoughts on how we can help to make the lives of those in the Third Age more fulfilling and rewarding. Firstly, we need to recognize that the elderly are not a homogeneous group. They can range from a fit, active and independent 85-year-old to a 65-year-old with rapidly advancing Alzheimer's disease to a retired 55-year-old with both a dependent parent and still dependent student children. The social aspect I referred to earlier is, of course, the big question. Who will care for the elderly? The question is a complex one, and I would like to illustrate this by making a few comparisons with the past. In earlier times, large extended families living in the same area were the norm. This meant the sharing of care for the grandparents' generation was usual. Now, however, the mobility of the population combined with smaller families often means there are, quite simply, no family members to take care of an older person. The breakdown of traditional family structures and the increase in divorce has exacerbated this. The other big question, the economic one, involves the increasing cost of adjustment to this situation and how the burden of this cost can most equitably be shared between, on the one hand, the elderly and their families, and on the other, the relatively smaller number of people of working age whose tax contributions have to be used to fund pensions and services for an increasingly elderly population, as well as all the other demands on the public purse. The questions raised by this demographic change are exercising governments all over Europe, and there is naturally widespread debate about how best to help financially those who can to remain independent, while supporting those who cannot, and ensuring that they continue a sometimes failing life with dignity. I promise to finish with a few thoughts about how we might come closer to achieving this. More imaginative use is being made of existing property by adapting it for elderly, often less able people, and their needs are now being kept in mind by planners, local authorities and transport providers. But not forgetting the cry, where does the money come from? We need radically to rethink the arrangements for funding pensions and younger people's planning for retirement. Innovative insurance schemes should be developed to assist people in providing for the future, and financial institutions ought to be thinking about these. So I will close by repeating that I believe we should do everything to enable the elderly to live meaningful and rewarding lives. After all, we will be in the same situation all too soon. Thank you, and I would welcome any questions or comments from the floor. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.